Every sound designer is asked to create some sort of a world in sound. And it's most inspiring when the whole movie essentially requires an original new world of sound. <laughs> from the background sounds, the ambiences, the wind, the storms, the hum inside a spaceship, as well as the mechanical sounds of motors and robot arms and legs and treads. The big thing that's unique about sound design and animation um, is the fact that you get nothing for free. You don't get on a set and hear the way the environment sounds naturally, or the way somebody walks across a room, or just their voice. Wally. But in this case, because there isn't dialogue that often, it puts all this emphasis on every little squeak, beep, squawk. Now they all have to mean something. Or you have to be careful that if you use them, people will think they mean something. The sound that Eve and Wally made, that was their character. That was how people were going to connect to them. So you have to be in complete control about whether there should be sound and what sounds they are and how many they are and when they happen. You learn that the most important thing that you can do as a sound designer is to make the right choice for the right sound at the right moment in a film. Ben Burt is an Academy Award-winning sound designer who um, did his very first work on the first Star Wars movies. And in many ways, he's considered the father of modern sound design. There are these iconic sounds that everybody knows. And you meet Ben, and it's like meeting your seventh grade science teacher. He is your seventh grade science teacher. He is the guy that you're like, uh, can you explain to me how gravity works? And he will sit down and explain it to you in a way that you completely understand it using sound effects. I wanted to create a sound for Eve's laser gun in her arm. And I discovered uh, years ago that if you strike a slinky-like spring with any object, you don't just get a clunk on the pickup mic or a ping, you get a pew. <laughs> That happens because the high frequencies travel faster than the low frequencies. So if you listen to the sound far away down the wire, the high frequencies get there first, and then the sort of mid frequencies and the low frequencies. So you get... It's a laser gun. Most of my experience in creating sound has been in an era when you can go outside with a small portable tape recorder and gather sounds in the real world. But I've always been fascinated by the roots of sound design for movies, which really goes back to the days when devices were built to create all kinds of sounds. Disney had an artist with them for many, many years named Jimmy McDonald. And over the years, he and his team built hundreds of props which were used to create sounds in the Disney cartoons. <laughs> Disney style was to use musical sounds for sound effects. If a character impacts on the wall, that hit on the wall will probably be a cymbal crash or maybe it's a funny timpani drum being struck. <laughs> if somebody zipped across the frame, you might hear a whistle or a flute. And it worked well because those kinds of musical sounds could be controlled in the studio. Recording equipment in the earliest days was very bulky. You couldn't take it outside and go on location to record a train. And so the artists at Disney would simulate the sound right there in the studio. These gadgets could be played as if they were musical instruments, and the timing of the sounds could be tailored to exactly match the picture. This is a rain machine. I have it just loaded in there with, with little finishing nails, nailed all on strips, and then a couple of hands full of Mexican peas. 
and by rotating it slowly you'll get the rain sound. And then get some high pitch squeaks by getting close. Great. Fortunately, this collection has been preserved by Joe Harrington, sound mixer and sound designer at Walt Disney Imagineering. So I had the opportunity to get a fantastic tour. This is a classic piece of gear. Push this clockwise, kind of fast. Okay. That was an old machine gun. <laughs> Drawbridge chains. Hold that in your hand and pull that back. Okay. Oh yeah, S uh, screen door. Yeah. <laughs> right. Now, see, I would have gone out and tried to find a screen door. You know, going to a lot of trouble, driven somewhere, waited till it was quiet, but here it is right here. Fabulous. It's only been in recent years that I've kind of rediscovered the value of trying to um, stage or construct a device that you can control. In the earliest days of live action film and animation, if they needed wind, they would use a wind machine. and you can go fast and you can go slow or you can speed up and create a gust of wind. A lot of the wind that we hear in movies has been this artificial wind, just this canvas being scraped against wood. But actually I discovered by accident another way to get wind. And that particular sound was used in the big toxic waste storm. Another classic device is the thunder sheet. It's a piece of sheet metal, and you can get a wonderful low frequency rumble out of it. The thunder sheet is used a number of places. I think one of the reasons Ben is so good at his job is because he's a true fan of sound design and he's an avid historian. He's always thinking and always working and he's a total geek about sound. It makes him just that much more knowledgeable about what, what are the options, you know, what has been done and what c could be done that hasn't. He's a bit like Mr. Wizard, you know, where you'd stop by his lab and be like, oh, Angus, I'm glad you decided to show up. I'm uh, working on the sound effect for uh, Wally's treads, and I'm combining the sound of a chinchilla mating with a wildebeest driving a cement truck. It was something new for us also at Pixar that we had a sound designer in-house on a film before post, you know? It was a little funny at first for me when um, Andrew would start uh, evaluating sounds that I was making. He would show up and five or six other, a group would show up and they'd all sit around and I'd, I'd play one little sound of a door close and click and everybody would think about it and there'd be a discussion. If it was a softer zip line kind of thing, maybe we could get away with keeping it in there. But I think whatever we end up in the final equation, we should let the key, that what his job is win out. We're dealing with sound effects on our initial rough storyboard reels to a level of commentary and critique that I would usually wait for post-production. That's a little too kazooey. You just want a more sort of a, almost Eve-like room, you know, kind of glow. If that sound squeak effect. sounds kind of sad and you never meant it to sound sad, it'll throw it that way. So you can't ignore it. When Ben came on, 
he had to really figure out what's, what's the overall language in this movie for these types of characters and how does that fit into the overall soundscape that we're designing for the film. I usually first think uh, if these objects, places, or robots, or machines really existed, what would they sound like? How would they be powered? What would be the actual physics of how they work? But if I find a sound isn't working within a scene, I'll abandon the science and go with what works emotionally. He's so thoughtful about these things that he creates that really almost wouldn't need a logic, except that the only reason they are great is because they have a whole logic and backstory. It's what makes what he does feel real. It makes you believe it. Wally has a multitude of motors, and he very deliberately picked out different sounds for each of these movements. And they can be orchestrated together to punctuate the emotions with sounds that are justifiable as part of his function. And really, once he came on and, and started developing the core sound of Wally, we were just like, yes, you know, this is what we were looking for. We've always tried to give Eve kind of very soothing, high-tech, quiet tonalities, almost like little bits of music. And there's a mystery, uh, there's a sense of energy and enchantment with her. But it's kind of a soft kind of background uh, kind of idea with sound. And, and it's, it's emotional. All of them have an array of sounds that are character-based. The autopilot is filled with bells and whistles and many big motors, and he's multitasking like no other character. So there's always some sense of activity and calculating going on. With Mo, he's sort of a nervous little cleaning droid, so often he's revving his motor a little bit, like he's eager to do something else. You know, little snippets of sound keep him frenetic. When you use sounds gathered in the outside world, the real world, and you bring them into a science fiction film, you get the credibility of those sounds to sell to the audience the reality of what's really just a very uh, fantastic world. I heard a sound in an old war movie on TV. There was a private cranking a generator to provide power for an army radio in the field. I found one of these old army generators on eBay. And it's the sound we use for Wally when he has to be quiet in a given scene. He's not going very fast. When Wally gets going at high speed, additional sounds are added to his driving motors. And one of the principal elements is, comes from a device called the inertia starter, used to start the engine on an old airplane. And it's a classic sound, often used for the roadrunner speeding up or the Tasmanian devil spinning in a circle. Creating sound effects is, is one task, but creating voices is the hardest task for me as a sound designer. Our audience is very sensitive to analyzing voices because we do it all day long, every day. Aha! Ha! Sound effects can function uh, like a voice. Sound effects can be expressive. <laughs> Another technique would be to start with the human performance and modulate a sound effect. The human performance is driving the shape of the twanging juice harp. Disney was also uh, responsible for using one of the most innovative electronic tools for modifying the human voice. Uh, back in the 1940s, the device was called the Sonovox. 
and uh, this device involved playing a sound over a small pair of speakers and a performer would hold the speakers against their throat. The train sounds are all on here. And you hold these over your vocal cords and move your lips, like this. All aboard, all aboard, clear the track. All aboard, let's go. Eve, Eve. The voice of Eve is a modern example of the same technique. In this case, I'm using a device called a vocoder. And you can input into this device a human recording, a human voice at one end. Go ahead. In this case, it's Alyssa Knight. Directivo. 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 I like that. And at the other side of the device, you can put in a tone. Directivo. 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 Changing the performance and giving it electronic nuances. Aimulanka. Directivo. You wanted to have all the soul of a, of a, a human being might have in the performance, but you wanted it to sound like the voices were synthesized, that they were coming from a machine. <sighs> Wally's voice started with recordings I would make of myself. And then it's analyzed and broken up into its component parts within the computer. It changes the volume and pitch of the sound. And the tilt of the pen actually affects the way the sound is, is, is resynthesized in the computer. And I can add an additional level of performance to it that way. Wally. Wally. There was probably a year's worth of work. No, no, no. Until we really arrived at a set of sounds for the main characters that we felt comfortable with, that we had created a voice. My editor, Steve Schaefer, and I would just go through and go, all right, we need something that sounds sad but slightly hopeful, you know? And then you would just go through all these sounds. Wally. Wally. I think, I think the front half, I think the front half might work better. <laughs> yeah. The more inventive sounds get, the more they become subjective, and they become sounds in the ears of the beholder. A ray gun, a force field, they're interchangeable. Most of these sounds are just so abstract that the ultimate judgment has to be in the hands of, of one person, and that is Andrew Stanton. I want to take complete credit for having tracked down Ben Burt and gotten him to say yes on this film, and that's about where it ends. And then um, the rest of the credit just goes to him for achieving the goal that I had thrown his way of making me not only believe, but like this whole cast of characters in this world. The end result is a product which involved thousands maybe tens of thousands of decisions, and certainly thousands of sounds. And all of these sounds add up to the world of Wally.